Well, God bless you. I'm glad to see you tuning in once again. We've been in a series of talking about strong faith or how to build your faith. So I just want to say thank you for joining me once again on this Wednesday morning or Wednesday afternoon. So let's go ahead and pray and let's get right into this word. Father, we thank you right now. We give you the praise and the glory. We just welcome your presence of God in each and every home. And Lord, we just thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy. We just thank you, Father, that you got a strategy and a plan that you've given to your body, your church. So we thank you, Father, for, I mean, your awesome, great love. We do believe you're the God who brings us through all of our trouble. So we give you thanks this morning, this afternoon, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we've been in a series, Building Your Faith, and you can understand why it's so important to have strong faith. So this whole week, we've been tackling the subject about strong faith. So we've been looking at our foundation scripture, where it talks about Habakkuk 2, verse 1 through 4, where it really gets into God gives the give us a vision, write that vision down, and then it also talk about the just shall live by his faith. So every believer who knows the Lord Jesus, we should be living by our faith, living by faith. So that's why we start talking about the importance of faith. And so last time we talked about, too, about little faith, limiting thoughts, but how to develop strong faith. So I've been defining what strong faith is according to the word and why is it so important. We looked at Luke chapter 2, verse 40, where it talks about Jesus was strong in spirit, meaning this, this man, Jesus, he was full of faith. Then in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, we see that Jesus talked about if you're going to take out a strong man, you got to be stronger than him. In the context of the scripture, he's talking about he casts out the devil because he's stronger than him, in other words. He has the spirit of God, the power of God on him. And so he just tells the devil what to do, and the devil has no choice but to do it. And so then we went to Acts chapter 3, verse 6, and 9, and verse 16. We see that Peter said it was through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was strengthened, was made strong. So you can see the awesome power of faith when we really trust God. Then we went to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. We also see that um, that the Bible gives us the heroes of faith. When in verse 34, it says, they quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness was made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And it says, women received their dead raised to life again. So Jesus taught it, you know, with faith in God, all things are possible. So you can see why faith is so important. Why it's so important to God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it said, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I really believe God gives the revelation that verse, why faith pleases him so much, because he didn't say love please him. He said your faith please him. Why is that so important? Because through God's grace and love, he given us everything. But we can't, he can't get it to us unless we believe him. So it pleased the Father when we have faith because it allowed him to put into our hands everything that he promised, everything that he prophesied to us, every prophetic word of your life. It all comes to pass when we believe God. That's why it's so important. Then we start talking about, you know, what the word strong mean in the Greek, in the Hebrew. We said do, um, the word strong means to make strong. It means to restore strength. It means to give strength. It also to mean make bold. See, when a person is strong, they're bold too. Then it also means to make rigid or to make hard. And then I gave you an analogy of concrete. It start off, you know, soft. But when you mix it with the right ingredients, give it some time, it's hardened. So you can't reshape it once it's hardened. And the same thing, your faith. It should be so rock solid in Christ that nothing bothers you, especially in the times that we're in. It also means to be strong means to display strength. It means to have or take courage or to keep hold of. It means to hold up. See, you shouldn't be falling apart. I shouldn't be falling apart. With strong faith, we don't fall apart. It also means to strengthen oneself. And this is so important because when it says be strong, 
we find David, I believe it's 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, after they came back, everything was taken. His wives, his children, all his the men with them, their wives and everything was taken. It got so bad that their men that David, you know, hung out with, they wanted to, uh, they about to stone him. They was thinking about killing him and stone him. So David did something that was interesting. The Bible says that he got away from the group, the crowd. Then he, and the Bible says the, the David, he strengthened himself in the Lord. What made David turn around that situation? He sought God. He knew there's power and strength that could come from God. He knew that, hey, this word being strong, you can become strong even while you feel like you're weak. It's something that you can, you, you can rise up on, from the inside and trust God and overcome and overpower the, the attack or the enemy. So David, he actually became stronger. While he should be down and depressed and while everybody's ready to kill the man, he encouraged himself. In other words, that word encouraged himself means he became strong. He started thinking about God. He started praising God. He started thinking about the victory that God has given him. And so God, so David got bold. He said, shall I pursue, you know, and overtake and recover all? When a man speak to God in faith, God respond back. Surely you're going to take it all back and I'm going to give you even more. So this is something that the believer should be looking at. Instead of being weak in faith, instead of being intimidated by the enemy, we should be looking to God. Shall we pursue this adversary? Shall we overtake him and recover all? I believe God's going to tell you the same thing he told David. When you're in faith, you can get everything that the devil has taken away from you. So now, we also talked about the kingdom assignment. Your kingdom assignment demands strong faith. God didn't give you an assignment that, you know, that's going to be easy. No, he gave you an assignment that says that you got the potential and you got his power to fulfill it. So now we looked at Joshua, one of my favorite stories in Joshua, because he's taken over the mantle, the leadership position. Moses is about to go. Now he's coming in. And so we see in the Bible that we already talked about that Joshua was told, be strong and very courageous, seven times, to the point where we see that Joshua began to tell all the men, be strong and be very courageous, where he takes down these kings and he tells his other leaders, put your foot on their neck. And I really believe it's time for you to put your foot on their neck. Notice the word, the Hebrew word for, for, for five is grace, it's grace, it's grace. So five kings he had, you know, underneath his feet. I believe you're going to see God's grace come upon your life and you're going to take out these five adversaries that keep trying to hold you down and intimidate you. Now, he says here in verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. God is clear on that. He says, as I was with Moses, so I be with you. You got you to gotta tell yourself, God is with me too. God is with your family. God is with you. And no matter what he says here, the next part of the verse, I will not leave you nor forsake you. So quit acting like God's going to leave you. Quit acting like, you know, God is not there. He's there, but he's requiring you to be strong because he says in verse six, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as they inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So, so God said, look, Joshua, you my new leader. But I can't do anything with you. I won't be able to conquer your adversary until you be strong and very courageous. And so he tells them that I'm not going to leave you, nor will I forsake you. And then verse 7, he says it again, only be strong and very courageous. There is no place for fear here. Why should we be afraid when we have God on our side? Then he says that you may observe to do according to all the law which most of my servant command you. So you're not going to obey God if you're afraid of the enemy. You're not going to fulfill your kingdom assignment if you think he can overpower you. So he says here, be strong, very courageous, and start meditating in my word. Then he says here, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. So God saying the prosperity and the success is not in God's hand, but it's in Joshua's hand. And it says, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, 
So we should be meditating on the word so we can build our faith up for our kingdom assignment. And here he says, look, but you shall meditate in it day and night. I'm going to challenge you in the morning. If you're not meditate on the word, grab hold of the scripture that the spirit of God tell you to, to meditate on. I can tell you the, the scripture that I meditate on all the time. And so meditate on those scriptures day and night. Don't go to sleep without meditating on those words. If you want to see breakthrough, you got to do what the Bible told you and told me. So he said, but you shall meditate, meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So God gives Joshua the remedy, the key in order to become successful. And now, Verse 9, once again, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. How many believers is afraid and also, it says, nor be dismayed? Because he says, For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So no matter where you go, God is with you. So that just reminds me about the blessings. In Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, it talks about the blessings. How God would take care, take out your enemy. How the Bible says you're blessed going out and you're blessed coming in. I don't, I don't consider going out, getting a coronavirus, coming back in with it is called blessed. That's part of the curse. That's why I'm telling you, if you stand in faith and trust God, go where he tells you to go, do what you're supposed to be doing. We're not trying to tempt God. We're not trying to do any such thing. Jesus taught us, don't try to tempt the Lord. When Satan tells him to jump off the mountain, you know, Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes, there's angels around you. And yes, there's a divine protection. But you got to operate in the, you know, in the, in the word. And you got to be skillful with that word. So no, I'm not going out trying to rub everything and, you know, you know, sniff everything and tell everybody to call for me. But I am telling them if they do call for me, I'm not getting anything if they have it. Why? Because the word says that, you go out blessed, you're coming in blessed. So you got to start trusting God if you're not and start believing God. Now, we looked at the case study last week about uh, Romans 4, verse 16. And we looked at Abraham because the Bible talks about he was strong in faith. And I gave you five characteristics last week, I mean yesterday, about faith, strong faith characteristics. And we, and we uh, outlined it, you know, with, I, I got to finish this up. So we outlined it as number one. We saw in verse 17, as it is written, it said, always, always, strong faith is always based upon God's word. Don't add anything to it. Stay with what God said. Then verse 17, it says, even God will call those things which be not as though they were. So strong faith always counted things that are, that, let me slow down. Strong faith count things that be not as though they were. So when God says something to you, remember, he's eternal, he's past, present, and future. So if God says something, you know it's real because he occupied eternity. He is the eternal God. So if he says something tomorrow, he's already in that tomorrow. So all you got to do is just trust and believe God. So this is another characteristic of faith. So then strong faith. Then three, we said in verse 18, it said, who gives hope, believe. See, strong faith does not look at the odds. Strong faith always look at God. See, strong faith never said there's anything that could come up against my faith because there's nothing that can, you know, nothing can defeat you. Why? Because you got a word from God. So strong faith never hears what the doctor is saying and cancel out what you believe. No matter how it looks, strong faith says, I still trust God. I still believe God. See, I don't care how much the deck stacks up against you. Strong faith said, if God is for me, who can be against me? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And so this is where you got to catch a hold of what the characteristics of strong faith. Now, if you don't, if your faith doesn't have these characteristics, then you're going to have to start getting the word, start confessing, start confessing the word. And I'm going to teach you some more things how to get that faith built up. So then number four, we said, and being not weak in faith. Now, this is something here is the characteristic of strong faith when we find in verse 19. Faith tells time what time it is. Strong faith never grows weak. See, you'll remember I taught you the other day that strong faith never, you know, never get, you know, governed by time. 
No, because why? God created time. Okay? God created time. When you see in Genesis where he makes the, the moon, the stars, you know, you know, the heavenly luminaries, that's where time began. But with God, there is no such thing as time. So God created time. How did he create it? He created it by faith. So your faith should dominate your dominate time. And once you get a hold of that faith, dominate time, it always keeps you in the presence. And when you stay in the present, you got it now. Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. Now, let me give you this other one because I got to get you into to what God gave me to do this morning. Verse 20 says, but strong faith never wavers, stagger or doubt through unbelief, the promise of God. Why? See, strong faith give God the glory up front. See, remember the Bible says that in Abraham, he was giving glory to God. What, he, what was he doing? He praising God because he can see that son. Remember, he's called, God changed his name. So he, every time he hears his name change, he's the father of many nations. He sees his, his wife name change. And so therefore, and she's the mother of many nations. So what do you find here? We see that strong faith laughs at the enemy. Strong faith doesn't lose its joy. Strong faith keep giving God the praise and all the glory. See, this is the characteristic of strong faith. When you hear bad news, you give God shouting the praise. I've always learned about faith. Faith never tells me, tell God how he's going to do it. I just believe he did it. Secondly, when the enemy try to put more pressure on you, this is what I typically do. Say you're running out of bullets. You're running out of, you know, your, your strategy is not working already. So therefore, I'm going to give God the glory and the praise because I know I'm getting closer because the pressure is on you, Satan. It's not on me. It's not on my God because he, what he said, he's able to perform it. And so then I gave you the definition that strong faith is really being fully persuaded. See, many believers not fully persuaded. They still believe the coronavirus is going to get them. As long as you believe that there's a there's an element of fear and intimidation. And that's what I want to get into about intimidation today, how to deal with it. So now, and so the next thing we said is fully persuaded. What are you fully persuaded? What God spoke to you, what God promised. God promised and he never lies. And then the third thing about this here, what strong faith is, that God is going to perform it. Take the pressure off of you. I'm taking the pressure off of me. I am not responsible of taking care of myself. I gave that over to the Lord Jesus. When he became my Lord and Savior, he's not responsible of feeding me. He's not responsible of keeping me healthy and strong. Oh, yes, I, I got a part to play. You got a part to play in it, too. It's talking about walking in, in faith, walking in obedience to the Lord. And then also, let's, let's get into this thing because of, it's time for the believers to Walk in strong faith instead of letting the enemy, you know, get them in intimidated. So remember, I told you about this here. This was, you know, you know, little faith, right? You, you can't get much out of that. Then we talked about saving faith. And I told you, Romans 12, verse 3, talks about God gave to every believer the measure of faith. But then I told you, hey, this is what we're going after, strong faith. You know, see the difference in size, difference in size, strong faith, strong faith. And I said, strong faith. It's mandatory for you to fulfill your kingdom assignment. So let me get this here moving. And let's hurry up. Because I got a new one. Now, when we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, the apostle Paul began to talk about talk to, to his son. He began to start encouraging because Timothy seemed like he's he's intimidated. He's timid. So the apostle Paul got to get his son from out of from being this way. So he says in verse 18. In first, first Timothy chapter 1, he said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecy previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. In other words, he's saying to you, look, there's some prophecy that has been prophesied over your life. There is a potential and some gifts inside you, and I'm charging you to commit to them. Then he also said that to commit to them, you got to wage a good warfare. You got to wage a good warfare. So this tells you the will of God for your life is not automatic. The things that God wants to do in your life, you're going to have to begin to wage a good warfare. And then he says, verse 19, again, having faith. 
You can't just throw away your faith, and neither can I. And says, and having faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have, you know, suffered shipwreck. Some people have had shipwreck faith. They abandoned their faith. And I'm, I want to encourage you, don't abandon your faith. Look, most often you're going through things because the devil don't want you to fulfill your kingdom assignment. So it's not about the big house. It's not about the new car or the new gator shoes. What it's about that there is a potential, there is something inside you that's going to give God the glory, but he wants to keep attacking you and keep getting you to a place where you abandon your faith. But don't do that. Uh-uh. Don't do that. Now, when we go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, the Apostle Paul is still on his son, Timothy. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, goodness, godliness, faith, see it, love, patience, gentleness. And then verse 12, we know it, it says, fight the good fight of faith. If you fight this fight, he's telling his son, you will win this fight. But you got to be willing to fight in church you got to start fighting this fight. And then it says, lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession, the presence of many witnesses. You know, so your neighbors heard you that you said you was a Christian, but act like one right now. Your neighbors heard you say that you are a believer, then come on, stand your ground and show them what a, what a true believer is at this point. Don't back down right now. I want to encourage you. Your kingdom assignment needs strong faith. And then the Apostle Paul says in verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives, you know, life to all things. Now, when we go to verse 20, we find something that's amazing because the Apostle Paul is still on his son. He says, Old Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Now, that's strong and that's powerful. There are some things that God has entrusted you. I'm talking to you, those who's watching. And you get, it's time for you to guard what was committed to you. And then he says here, to your trust, avoid the profane and idle babbling and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. You, we, cannot, we cannot start putting in our mouth the power of this coronavirus, what we should be in our mouth, the power of the word of God. We should be saying what the anointing would do to this virus if it touches you or touches me. We should be saying God has anointed you. God has protected you. There, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You cannot start speaking about what it can do. You should be speaking about what God can do. And then it says in verse 21, it said, by professing to some have strayed concerning the faith. See, I got to watch my mouth. I just can't just get into idle talk. I just can't start talking about what this virus is doing. I should be talking about what God is doing through you and through me. Then we would go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I love this here because I want you to grab hold of verse 1. It says, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to, here's a promise for you. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So Christ, my God, in you and me, he, he promised us life. Remember, Jesus said, I come to give you life, life more abundantly. So you got a promise of life. You have a guarantee by Christ while you're in Christ that you can fulfill all your days. You can fulfill every day if you just listen to what God has to tell you and do what God told you to do. And so here you have this thing called the promise of life. And so you don't have a promise of death over you. You got a promise of life in Christ Jesus. Now, I got to hurry, hurry up here because now when we go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, again, I'm showing you how the Apostle Paul dealing with his son. It seemed like he's intimidated. I remember some days that I got intimidated. My younger brother, you know, he had this friend who wanted to play me in some basketball. You know, I'm older than a guy, two years older, you know, tall, you know, taller than him. This, this guy here, he, you know, and I played him the first time, I whooped him good. I whooped him good, you know. I was putting all kinds of moves behind the back, you know, just driving to the, you know, to the you know, rim and just, you know, just shooting all over him. But one thing he, he did was he, he, he started a different tactic, a strategy. Every time I was about to ready to shoot, he would scream and yell. His name was Roscoe. Yeah, Roscoe. And what this Roscoe would do, that every time I would try to, you know, back him up and shoot, he would try to scare me. He would start, you know, doing a lot of talk, you know, trash talking. And so, but it got to a point where it began to become effective. I mean, I start shooting and go, and the ball going over the rim. You know, I'm, sorry, I'm doing a layup and the ball don't even go anywhere. So he, his, his, his strategy, he didn't have the talent to beat me, 
but he came up with a strategy. What did he do? He, he found an area of weakness that got me afraid, that I became, you know, I started losing my confidence in my shot. You know, I was able to go out and shoot, but now I can't get a, I mean, I'm throwing up bricks right now. What did he do? He, he found something that can cause me to, you know, to, 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 to defeat myself, in other words. So I never, I never really, I never understood that. But this guy here, he worked on my faith, in other words, and he got me to a place where I was second guessing myself. Knew I was, I beat them before when the first time we played. I mean, I was dribbling all over, all, you know, I, I made the guy embarrass him. But now he's embarrassing me. So it wasn't really him, it's what I allowed to get into my life. I became, you know, afraid. I became intimidated. I became, you know, second guessing my shots. And, I, and then I began to lose. I kept, get, I kept losing against this guy. It would be close, but he always hit the last point to win. So what I'm, what I'm telling you, you got to get the fear and the intimidation out. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, this is where the Apostle Paul began to talk about something that's so powerful, you know. And he talks about there is some genuine faith in you. Let me read verse 5. He said, when I call to remember the genuine faith that is in you, you got genuine faith in you. He said, and then he said, he said, this is not only in you, but this was in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. It says, and I am persuaded it is in you also. See, I believe there's some faith in you right now. And, you know, and it's genuine. But you, you but you got to deal with the spirit that came to intimidate you. And then it says, verse six, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you. See, you got something in you. You've been given the spirit of the living God. You got, I mean, you got Jesus, you got the Godhead inside you. And nevertheless, Timothy, he's still being timid. He's still, you know, uh, you know, uh, is afraid. He's second guessing himself. So, so his spiritual father said, look, I know what's in you because I laid, my, I laid my hands on you. And I know this gift was imparted to you. So he said, tell his son, you stir that gift up. You stir up that gift because I know it's in you, it's in your mother, and it's in your, you know, grandmother. And notice it says here that he's, in verse 6, he said, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God. You see, the gift of God needs your faith. In order for, for, in order for you to operate in your gift, you're going to have to operate also in faith. See, this, this thing was, was a, a, shutting down this man's faith. He has a gift inside him. He got the Spirit of God, you know, an anointing and you know, and this impartation, but yet it's not being effective. What's shutting it down? Because he's being timid. He allowed the adversary to bother him. Now notice it says here, I gotta finish this up. Therefore, I want I want to remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hand. So the apostle Paul said, I know it's in you because it was it was imparted to you. When I pray for you, when I lay hands on you. And then he says, for God has, has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, I know we like to quote that God has not given the spirit of fear, but I want you to keep bringing this thing back into context. He said, there's something inside you. There's a prophecy. There's anointing. There's a, there's a calling on your life. And he says, look, I'm telling you to remind yourself that it's in you because I know it's in you because I, I'm the one who lay hands on you. And you have this gift, but it's not being used for the kingdom. So he said, get rid of the fear so that you can operate in your kingdom assignment. See, we like to use this here, and it's okay to use it. But in the context, he said, look, get busy again about the kingdom. Get rid of everything that's stopping you from fulfilling what God's called you to do. See, some of you, you're anointed, and God gave you the gift of healing, but you're not out there laying hands. Some of you got the gift of prophecy, but you're still hiding under your bed. See, you got to stir that gift up, and you got to realize what's in you is greater than what's out there. Now, he says here, look. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but he said, but God gave you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. So the apostle Paul said, look, I got to get you from running from this coronavirus. I got to get you from being intimidated by this adversary. He said, look, there's a gift deposit inside you. You got the spirit of the living God inside you, and it's time for you to stir up your faith and you're going to see the spirit of God flow into operation. Now, I want to read you this story, you know, again, from John G. Lake. I mean, this is powerful. And I want you to get a hold of it, you know. 
And again, you know, this could, you know, John G. Lake, he was born in, I think, 1870. 1870. And a man can have that type of faith then. What kind of faith should we have now? And then I'm going to take you to 2 Timothy because now you can begin to understand why we see in the scripture why the apostle Paul is on his son. Again, you can't tolerate you can't tolerate being intimidated by your enemies. You know, and, and he talks about in 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, that's where we start seeing you, therefore, you be my son, you be strong. You be strong. Now, let me tell you, read this paragraph that John G. Lake said. He says, this is interesting. See, it, I'm going to say it again. It takes faith to exercise your gift of God. See, this is why Satan sends out a spirit of fear because he don't want you to operate in your gift. See, as long as we intimidate by the enemy and we allow the spirit of fear to come in, you know, how do that? Let me give you an example. God tell you to go lay hands on, on somebody that's in a wheelchair. You know what the spirit of fear would do? Well, you know that's hard. You know that person's in this wheelchair. You know ain't no power going to flow. You begin to try to intimidate you. And he began to start telling you what's going, what is not going to happen. So he tried to, you know, again, this guy, Roscoe, he was playing games with my head. Oh, you ain't going to make that shot. I made that shot many a time. But when he said I wasn't going to make the shot, I didn't make the shot. I started letting this guy intimidate me. I should have told him, watch me. I should have talked back to him, you know, but I didn't. I just kept listening to him and let at his feet this here, this spirit. And this spirit came in my life and started affecting me. Now, let me read this because this, I believe this is going to bless you. John G. Lake says, there are so many preachers who are afraid of the devil. That's right. He said that. He said, they have no idea how big God is who dwell in, in them. He said, they have no idea of the power given to you because God dwells in you. Then he says, they preach fear of the devil, fear of demons, and fear of the influence, and fear of that influence, and fear of some other power. It's always going to be something else. You know, whether it's the coronavirus or it's going to be now the other virus, and it's going to be something else. See, this is a, this is a defining moment, church. We better overcome this thing, and we got to get ourselves back into strong faith. Then he says here, watch. It says, if the Holy Ghost has come down from heaven into your soul, common sense teaches us that he has made you the master, thereby every other power in the world. So he said, because the Spirit of God came in you, come on, you're the master over this devil. And then he says here, wow, otherwise the word of God is a blank falsehood. Because he said, for it declares, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he who's in us than this coronavirus. You see what he, where he headed to? So he said, look, if this is not true, then the, then the, then the Bible is a lie, in other words. But then he says here, and that's John, 1 John 4, 4. And then he also gives the scripture, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And it says, And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10, 19. Now you know that's got to be true. It's true when you when you first learn it's true right now. But notice this here. People is not operating that verse here. Because if we really believe that verse, we wouldn't be expecting that we're going to get this virus. We not, we wouldn't be expecting that we're going to get sick. Now look, he's and this is so powerful. He said, Jesus, this is Jesus himself. Behold, I give you power to tread up serpents and scorpions. I taught you already. Sickness origination came from Satan. Remember, his name was Lucifer, but when he became Satan, that's when all the disease and everything else came into the world when Adam and Eve listened to him and obeyed and, and obeyed Satan and disobeyed God. Now, so you can see God didn't create all this sickness. He's not, he's a creator of life. So I want you to see. Now, the Bible says Jesus came and he gave you power over scorpions, over the enemy. And it says, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Some believers think this stuff can hurt them. And that's why I'm working on your faith. I need you to hear this here because what Jesus said, remember we said, every word that Jesus said, it should begin to eliminate all your questions. It should eliminate all your questions. This here should tell you, well, okay, well, according to this word, I'm not getting no coronavirus. I'm not expecting it, and I'm going to stand in faith. 
I'm going to stand in faith and trust what God said, that this coronavirus is underneath my feet and every disease is underneath my feet because of what Jesus did. Let me wrap this up because it says here, then, you know, John G. Lake says, and if we had faith to believe that the greater than he is in us, bless God, we will be stepping out with boldness and majesty. So he said, if we really believe what the Bible says, we'll be stepping out in boldness and in majesty. He said, we will actually be living differently, you know. And notice it says here, if we really believe it, he says that the conscious supremacy of the Son of God will be to manifest in our lives instead of being subverted and bowed down and broken beneath the weight of sin and the power of darkness around us. So he said, look, once we become so conscious, in other words, of the greater ones inside us, it will cause anything else to bow before us. That's all sickness and that's anything that has to do with the power of darkness. Now, this is powerful. I believe this here. And the, then he says here, they will flee from us and keep away, <laughs> keep out of our way. I love this here. Because now, instead of us running from the devil and running from the coronavirus, it will start running from us. Would you, <laughs> would you get the revelation of that? He said, once we come to this, get to this mindset, of the supremacy of Christ in us and how powerful Jesus is and how the greater one is inside us. He said, we'll begin to walk out in boldness and majesty. We wouldn't be bowing down to this stuff. It will begin to bow down to us because greater is he who's in us than he that is in the world. That's a mind. That's got to be a paradigm shift for you us right now. Then he says here, watch this. They'll keep out of your way. And he said, he said I believe before God there is not a devil that will come comes within a hundred feet of a real God anointed Christian. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you about strong faith. He said, "Look, no devil is going to want to come close to you if you if you are truly a God anointed Christian. Why? Because remember Isaiah ten verse twenty seven, and when that and it shall come to pass that day that his burden shall be removed from off your shoulder." and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing oil? What about all these verses that we have learned over time and time? What about the power of God? We're not hearing about the power of God. We're hearing about the power of the devil. We're hearing about what everything, all the chaos. But believers, we get, we're coming out of that. We're coming out of that. And so, uh, um, so, that, so, I'm, so I want to encourage you. Break the intimidation. Break you know, the fear. It's time to overcome the adversary because truly you are more than conqueror. And see, now I want to encourage you. You got to start hearing the word, but I'm, to, I'm believing that the glory is about to hit you. I'm telling you that there's something, I mean, that's on a, it's being stirred up inside you. I, I, look, when you truly take your stand on the word, when, when you start saying, look, say, Jesus said, there's nothing you got can hurt me. Cancer can't hurt me. Death can't hurt me. Sickness can't hurt me. When you start truly rising up, see, and start taking your stand, you're going to realize what the devil been telling you and what he's been trying to do to you, he cannot. The only, only power he have is what we give him, you know, the authorization for. So I'm telling you right now, if you're dealing with sickness, start confessing over your body. You got the right to command. Satan, get out of my body in the name of Jesus. And now you speak to those organs. Organs, you are blessed. You're healed. Cells, you're blessed. I forbid, I forbid any type of virus, infection, anything to get in my body. Now, you, if you're sitting there saying, well, well, I did that before. No, you did it, but you probably wasn't in faith. Faith always worked. Faith always worked. Get yourself back into the word and start confessing what God said, and you're going to see the power of God. There's a gift inside you waiting on your faith. And once you start exercising it, you're going to be good to go. Now, I'll pick back up, you know, on, on this thing about Timothy because he charged his son. You ain't got no choice but to be strong. And right now, we don't have no choice to be strong. And once we, once we start armor up, gearing up, 
And once you start, I mean, I'm telling you, start coming and going to intercession. You know, I'm going to show you by building your most holy faith up, praying in the Holy Ghost. If you find yourself that you got something weak in you and you know it's not, you don't see results, don't blame God. Don't say the word doesn't work. What you got to do, all right. I'm going to go in the gym. Come on. You know, just like you go in the gym, you know, you know, you start when you first start off in the gym, you know, you're, you, you're not picking up no 500 pounds. You know, you may just be able to pick up the bar like me. But if you are determined to get in that gym, to get in the gym of the word, then I'm going to start meditating that word. I'm going to start. I'm going to start going to sleep with that word on. I'm going to start getting my, myself in spiritual shape. I'm going to get rid of the doubt. I'm going to quit listening to what the world's saying. And I'm going to start speaking what God said. God said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God promised you in Psalms 91, no plague shall come near your dwelling. If there is an attack on you, then there must be probably a reason. Like John G. Lake says, hey, if you, my God, if you get the revelation of who you are and who's inside you, no devil going to want to come near you. Think about it. There was no devil coming around Jesus. Jesus was invading their territory and he has casted them out. That's what he told us to do. So when you catch hold of who you are and the anointing inside you and you start releasing your faith, you are going to see God's power and you're going to start seeing victory. And I believe as long as you keep coming to this here Facebook with me, I'm going to keep working on you because I believe the Spirit of God is in me to teach you. We're getting ourselves. My God, this is the time you're going to get everything that the devil took from you because I'm getting mine back. While everybody's wondering if they're going to lose everything, I'm believing we're going to gain everything. This is opportunity for the church to give God all the glory. So i see you very soon. God bless you. Thank you, Lord.